Well, I want to introduce our first speaker for session one this evening, a biblical pattern of revival. Mark Jones, Dr. Mark Jones, is the minister at Faith Presbyterian Church in Vancouver, British Columbia. He is married to Barbara, and they have four children, Katie, Joshua, Thomas, and Matthew. Mark completed his PhD at Leiden University and is now a research associate at the University of the Free State. His published works include Why Heaven Kissed Earth, The Christology of the Puritan Reformed Orthodox Theologian Thomas Goodwin, the Diversity of a Tradition, Reformed Theological Debates in Puritan England, and a Puritan Theology, Doctrine for Life. It is a great privilege to have Dr. Jones with us this evening, so please, brother, come and preach to us. Well, thank you very much for coming out and inviting me to Chilliwack. I have uh, usually stop in Chilliwack en route to our church family camp, uh, just a few extra kilometers down the road. And uh, I know some of you, but most of you I don't believe I've ever seen before. So uh, please say hi after. Uh, feel free to chat and... Um, I would like to know more about you, as I assume you may wish to know a little more about me. Uh, I'm going to read tonight from Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And we'll pick up at verse 22 to the 41st verse, and then tomorrow morning, Lord willing, I'm going to consider especially verse 42, but to the end of the chapter. It's beginning at Acts chapter 2, verse 22. This is from the ESV. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness 
and continue to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Well, let's pray together and ask God's blessing upon the reading and preaching of his word. O Lord, our God, we praise you because you are our God. And the very utterance of our lips where we come into your presence is enough to humble us that we, mere sinners, mere beggars, those who are but dust and ashes, should come into the presence of the triune God in all of the splendor of your holiness, in all of the glory of your being, in all of the majesty of your name, we ask now that you will so bless us that we will know that we have met with God, that we will know that we are not simply to presume upon your grace, but every ounce of grace we receive from your hand is more than we deserve. But, O oh Lord, let it not be more than we ask for, for we desire grace upon grace in the person of Jesus Christ. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. I think if we read the Bible from a human perspective, in terms of how the Bible describes man, we can come away, at least for a great majority of the scriptures, feeling quite depressed about our situation. Indeed, not only about our situation, but the situation of God's people throughout the ages. There is, of course, in Genesis, in chapter 4, at the end of the chapter in verse 26, what I think was the first revival, when men began to call upon the name of the Lord. But by and large, as you look at the kings, as you look at the judges, as you look at God's people in time of exile and distress, what you find is that God's people go through periods where the blessing of God seems not to be present. Yes, there was Nineveh. Yes, there were Josiah's reforms. Yes, there have been times when God has blessed his people, the rebuilding of the temple. But for the most part, as you read the Old Testament, it is one sordid history of man's sin, rebellion, and wickedness against God. And not only that, but God not simply saying, well, that's fine, but God judging his people in sometimes the most severe ways. One only has to read 1 Corinthians chapter 10 to look at the litany of judgments that fell upon God's people. A far cry from what we would call revival. The question has to be asked, does anything change in Christ's own ministry? Whatever faults that you may supposedly find with the Old Testament prophets, here is a preacher with whom there is no fault. Here is a preacher that never misplaced one word. Here is a preacher that had the Spirit poured out upon him unlike any man had ever known. Here is a preacher that in everything that he spoke, he spoke accurately and truly. Everything that he said was directed to its proper end. Here was a preacher with whom no one could find fault. And indeed, that is the case. As we read Luke chapter 4, you find Christ opens up the scroll, speaks to the people about how he comes to bring release to the prisoners, how he is the anointed one, the Messiah, because the Spirit is poured out upon him. And you find that as he's preaching, people heard him gladly. They were amazed at him. But Christ committed what appears to be a fatal, fatal error. He continues to preach after he's preached a good sermon. And he continues to preach and he speaks to Jewish people sitting in a synagogue about God's desire to bless Gentiles that had happened in the Old Testament and was surely a foreshadowing of what would take place. And at that moment, 
At that moment, he struck the very deepest nerve of Jewish consciousness about all that they had believed themselves to be, that God blesses Gentiles. And how did they respond? They responded by trying to take his life from hero to zero, from having people marvel at what came from his lips to having people trying to take his very life. Why? Because he spoke to them about God's intention to bless people besides themselves. If there is no other testimony to man's wickedness, then surely Luke 4 alone shows that. But what about the rest of his ministry? Well, I hope I'm not being irreverent when I say that in many respects, Christ's public ministry was an utter failure. If you look, example, we could continue to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, Christ feeds thousands upon thousands of people. And what is their reaction as their, as their belly, as so many people's God is being met with food and their daily sustenance. What is their reaction? But we want to make you our king. They wanted Christ to be their king, their Messiah, their son of God, but they wanted him to be their king on their terms. That has always been the problem with so many of God's people. They want God on their terms. They wanted Christ on their terms. But then Christ does, again, something fatal to his preaching ministry. I mean, after all, who as a preacher would not desire to have a megachurch of roughly 10,000 people after one sermon? He continues to preach to them about what it means to be a real disciple, that unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you can have no part with me. And he goes from having a mega church to being reduced back to 12 in no time. Is that really a revival? It seems anything but a revival, so much so that he even has to say to his own disciples, are you too? going to leave? And if you suspect that perhaps I'm being unduly harsh upon Christ's ministry, that here is a man whose ministry was a failure in many respects, you simply cannot deny the fact that he was killed because of his preaching and his ministry. And from the perspective of mankind, it was a failure. What did his disciples do after being told repeatedly in Mark chapter 8, in Mark chapter 9, in Mark chapter 10, the Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of men. He will be handed over, crucified, but on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. Should not his disciples have been waiting outside of the tomb saying, well, any minute now? They had enough evidence you even find in Mark's gospel in chapter 8, I believe, where Christ says he spoke these things to them plainly. But a dead Messiah, from their perspective, was a false Messiah. And they reasoned, therefore, that they should either go back to one of Jesus' brothers, which didn't happen, or go back to their occupations. And they abandoned him. Christ's ministry was anything but a revival, except for one crucial aspect, his resurrection. And I'm not aware, at least from my own reading and my own studying of the issue, I'm not actually aware of anyone having said this, and as someone who's at least somewhat well-versed in the Reformed tradition, you typically don't want to say things publicly where you preface it by, I'm not, I'm not sure of anyone who's ever said this. But I'm going to. And I trust that perhaps you will end up agreeing with me, but please give me some time to at least elaborate on my point. As I have said, Christ's life his ministry on earth during his state of humiliation was anything but a revival. 
in terms of at least the outward effects. But what you have in his resurrection is the revival par excellence. You have the revival of not only a dead Messiah who is now exalted and given resurrection power, raised in power as Paul opens his letter to the Romans, but you have the revival of the entire church. You have, when Christ died, the church dying with him. And when Christ is raised, you have the entire church raised with him. That is the revival. And there is no revival, really, that you can even begin to compare with that. Now, we're not used to thinking of revival in that way. We hear of revival, and we typically go to Edwards. If we're theologically astute, we may even call the Reformation a revival. But we certainly don't think of a revival in terms of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet, if you're going to take the word at least literally, that is precisely what it was. Every single person who will behold the face of Jesus Christ was raised into heaven the very moment Christ was raised from the dead. That is the revival. But connected to that is not just his public resurrection, not just the vindication that he is the Messiah, and that is the word uh, justified in some translations in 1 Timothy 3.16, vindicated. It was his vindication, but his vindication didn't simply end at his resurrection. His vindication was Pentecost. And so just as his resurrection was the revival, so Pentecost attached to that is the revival because you cannot separate Pentecost from his resurrection. They belong together. And we'll see how crucial this is. But I'm going to say for the first part that apart from Pentecost, there is no salvation. Just as there is no salvation apart from Christ's death, and just as there is no salvation apart from his resurrection, there is no salvation apart from Pentecost. And why is that? Because Pentecost is the public vindication that Jesus is God's Son. And when he was raised from the dead, he spent 40 days instructing his disciples upon the nature of the kingdom. But after that period, he ascended into heaven. Upon ascending into heaven, he received something that he had not yet received. He received the promise of his Father. Here was the one who had come, whom the angels had been waiting for, and were utterly stunned as God made man had ascended into heaven for the first time. And that psalm, who is the King of glory, that psalm no doubt sung from the very lips of the angels as he ascended into the throne room of heaven and was seated at the right hand of the Father and is given what? the promised Holy Spirit. So that that promise was now his definitively, finally, once for all. And that may, I suspect, explain the remarkable effect of Pentecost. Why 3,000 that day Plus, were baptized and cut to the heart because Christ now had become Lord of the Spirit. He had been given his reward and now as a king coming into heaven, it was as if he was freshly anointed. And as he was anointed on his true human forehead, a real humanity anointed afresh with the Spirit, it's as if that anointing simply trickled down his forehead onto the very heads of his people. Pentecost, the promise of the Father. You find that in Luke chapter 24, verse 49. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. Who is doing the sending? It is the risen Christ. Christ. 
And then in Acts, beginning, and Luke ends with that note and begins with that note, and while staying with them in verse 4, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to do what? But to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. That promise, everything the Old Testament had been looking forward to, Everything that you read of in those servant songs in Isaiah 42 of the man of the Spirit. Everything that you read later on in Isaiah 61. Everything that you read about this king who is anointed has been fulfilled. The promise of the Father has taken place. And so apart from Pentecost, there is no salvation. But then secondly... And perhaps a little more provocatively, Pentecost is a unique, never-to-be-repeated event in its kind. Let me say that again. Pentecost is a unique, never-to-be-repeated event in its kind. Pentecost can never happen again. It happened once. It happened once because of all that it meant. And if you just read the nature of the language in chapter 2, you can come to really no other conclusion. Let me put it another way. For Pentecost to actually happen again, Christ would have to relinquish his flesh. He would have to be incarnate again. He would have to die according to all the scriptures had said. He would have to be raised again to life. He would have to ascend into heaven. And he would have to receive the promise of the Father and pour it out again upon the church. That is an utter impossibility. And therefore, what took place at Pentecost is an utter impossibility ever again. Pentecost is about Christ's ascension and receiving of the promise. Let me put this a different way. People were saved at Pentecost because they received the Holy Spirit. And people before that time had received the Holy Spirit. And the faith that Abraham walked by and the faith that David walked by, which is the faith that saves, as Paul illuminates the doctrine of justification in Romans 4 by appealing to Abraham and David and not Peter and James, that faith working through love, which is as a result of the Spirit at work in them, there is no change for believers before and after Pentecost in terms of their salvation, but there is a change for Christ. Instead of being the humbled, humbled, despised, rejected king, he is now the king of glory. He is now raised in power. He is now seated at his Father's right hand. Something happened at a point in history that can never happen again. And so the effects of Pentecost are so far-reaching, so radical, so extraordinary, because Pentecost is a vindication of what has happened in his resurrection. All of those Jewish people who were opposed to this idea that Jesus is the Christ could not deny the effects of Pentecost. But notwithstanding that, and I acknowledge that that is something where reform writers have differed, even a man no less than Martin Lloyd-Jones said that if we say Pentecost is a one-time event, then we have no grounds for expecting revival ever again. But while Pentecost may be a unique one-time event, the effects of Pentecost and the fact that Christ is able to bless his church at any time in history according to his prerogative is based entirely upon Pentecost. And so the ongoing effects of Pentecost are not the same. The next day, we don't see the same effects, and the next day, and the next day. It is not so-called uh, a state where the church is always in the same state. No, there are times of blessing and times where God judges his people. 
But because Pentecost has taken place, Christ is now in a position as the exalted king to rain down blessings upon the entire earth at any time or place in any manner he sees fit. And so while we may say that the resurrection and Pentecost is the capital R revival, we can certainly expect small R revivals in our day. And they do happen. And so what I want to look at tonight somewhat briefly are the effects of revival. If Pentecost is the revival, if Pentecost is the preeminent revival, then the effects we see at Pentecost ought to be the effects we see in revivals that take place thereafter. And you will find that a revival is an unusual blessing of God among his church, but not exclusively among his church. A revival isn't simply unconverted people becoming converted, and it's not simply the church being revived in its practice and piety and love for Christ. A revival is a time when the church experiences blessing, and because the church experiences blessing, people in the church are converted, and people outside of the church are brought in, and they are converted. But it is an unusual blessing in the church. God is always blessing his church. There is never a moment where Christ's foot is off the gas and he's forgotten about his church. He is in the habit of blessing his church repeatedly, day after day, hour after hour, minute after minute. But... A revival is when Christ, according to his sovereign prerogative, decides to bless the church in an unusual way. And what happens when that takes place? Well, I think that the first thing that happens is people are aware that the presence of God, they are aware of God's presence And we take this for granted. There's a type of casualness. There's a type of casualness in our Christian life. There's a type of casualness in our prayer life. There's a type of casualness in our Bible reading. There is a casualness that besets the people of God in a most grotesque way. Where we just think that we can stroll into the presence of God where we think that we can just simply utter a prayer and God is going to hear us and we can read our Bibles and God is going to meet with us. But in times of revival, you are aware of one thing and that is you are in the presence of God. And when you are in God's presence, you know that. And what a sad, sad, sad thing that there are many Christians who walk into church, walk into their prayer closets, and they are not in the presence of Almighty God because they are casual. But when revival comes, people are aware that they are confronted with God There is a holy confrontation with his people and they are struck by him. And this is what happens. It happens when God blesses preaching. It happens when God blesses conferences. It happens when God blesses individuals. There is a sort of holy hush that comes upon us. And if we're aware of nothing else, we're aware of this, that we are meeting with God. It happened to me once. I remember at university, I had a TV in the lounge and I had microwaved my food because at university, that's what you do, right? You just are microwaving food all day. And I managed to make my way in and start praying uh, before eating my food. And the next minute I realized that I was really praying. I hope you know the difference. 
between simply tipping your hat to God before you eat. And I'm not talking about long, drawn-out prayers and saying fancy theological words. You can make a very small prayer and you're meeting with God. But what I am saying is I started praying and I really started praying. And the next minute I realized my food is getting cold. But it didn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because when you meet with God, when you're in the presence with God, it doesn't matter if the very best steak you've ever cooked is turning into the very worst steak you've ever eaten. Revivals. People are in the presence of Almighty God. But then also, when that happens, the veil in a sense is taken away. And as long as we are walking in this land that we call earth and as long as we are breathing in air and as long as we are living in these mortal bodies we are living by faith and because we are living by faith we have a veil but that veil in our Christian life is not a veil that sort of stays the same degree of uh, ability for us to see through There is a sense in which the veil allows us to see more of God at times in our life and less of God in times of our life. And you can't help but see, as you read the Psalms, times when people simply feel abandoned. And yet, there are other times when people feel as though they are at least on the lips of Jesus Christ himself. But in times of revival, the veil, in a sense, is removed. And when the veil, when the veil is taken away, you come into the presence of God and you're able to see things about God that you have never seen. You're able to apprehend the attributes of God in a manner you'd never been able to apprehend. And you have Isaiah going through his own personal revival because he needed it. If you read the rest of Isaiah chapter 6, you'll find out he needed that revival. Because he was going to have to go and preach, knowing full well his preaching would have the opposite effect of what he wanted. But he comes into the presence of God and the veil is taken away and he sees the holiness of God. But he sees the holiness, not simply of God, that would utterly consume him. He sees the holiness of Jesus Christ. John 12, 41. He said these things, speaking of Isaiah, because he saw his glory. And the context is clearly speaking about Jesus Christ. He came into the presence of Jesus Christ, and he was struck by his holiness, and the veil had been taken away. And you can imagine what that must have been for Isaiah. That is when God blesses his people. He removes the veil to some degree. And we see more than we've ever seen before. But then also, if we are brought into the presence of God, and if the veil is taken away, And if we see God for who he really is, and not as we imagine him to be, and not as we would like him to be, but who he really is, we will inevitably be conscious of our utter unworthiness before him. The heinousness of our sin, the guilt and pollution of our very being. And so when Peter is preaching, One of the effects, not the only effect, but one of the effects is people are cut to the heart. Do you know that feeling? That feeling sometimes when you pray or sometimes when you hear a sermon, sometimes when it's as if though you're physically ill with your own depravity. That's not you in a time of a bad period in your life where, you know, your theology's gone out the window and it's a case of, well, you know, you really need to lift up your spirits. No, that's God being gracious to you. Because God was gracious to his church when Christ ascended and Peter preached. And the effect of that, not the only effect of that, but the effect of that is that men were cut to the heart. Men were cut to the heart. 
And I imagine that wasn't just some intellectual apprehension, we killed Jesus Christ. I imagine that that went to the very inner being of those men so that they felt sick at what they had done. And so revival will inevitably do that to any individual to whom God visits with. They will be guilty. They will be cut to the heart. And that is a blessing. Can you imagine what it might be like for us as parents? Would you be disappointed if one day your child came to you with overwhelming guilt that they were a sinner and acknowledging that they had sinned against you and rebelling against your authority and not listening to your advice and they'd rebelled against their teachers and they'd rebelled, most importantly, against Almighty God for not doing their schoolwork, not listening to their parents, not loving Him, and they come to you broken. What would you think? Would you say, oh no, I don't want you thinking like that. This isn't good for your self-esteem. Lift your yourself up. What parent wouldn't be warmed in their heart that God has met with their child? The problem with our child children is not that they're too broken, but that they are not broken. You should see my son. I love him to bits, humanly speaking, more than anything in the world, but he's a very fine soccer player, and he struts around and thinks he is the kingpin. He celebrates after his goals, And he needs to be humbled. And I have to pray, Lord, humble me and humble this young man. And I pray that he will come to the Lord, to me, to anyone broken over his sin. This isn't a bad thing. It's only a bad thing if it simply ends at that. And that is not what we read of, is it, in this chapter where Peter is preaching, because not only are we cut to the heart, but another effect takes place, and that is love for Jesus Christ, love for the triune God. Real love for Jesus Christ. Paul could not help, but it's as though every verse that poured from his hands and out of his heart was as though he wanted to speak about this great love that he has for Jesus Christ. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith. Paul spoke in so many different ways, but it was all in a way in which he could love Jesus Christ more. Now I had a real problem the other night. It was Thanksgiving on Sunday. Not last week, the week before. And you know what happened in my congregation? You won't believe this. They started getting heavy eyelids. Unbelievable. Now, of course, I know you believe it because you probably get heavy eyelids yourself, don't you? Well, I was preaching and I saw that they had heavy eyelids and even one of my very finest elders who never gets heavy eyelids had heavy eyelids. And I thought, well, I'm a pastor, and I need to get these people out of their slumber. And I said, you know what? Because I love my wife, I can't keep my hands off of her. I'm quite serious. When you love someone, you can't keep your hands off of them. I remember being uh, visited. Uh, There was a speaker at this conference. I won't say who he is, but his brother came to visit, and he came with his wife, and I was just struck at how in love these two were with each other. And they wanted to sit in in the back seat of the van on the way up here, and they wanted the seats as close together as possible were the very words of his wife. And he called her the queen. And we weren't sure if he was actually at the first time talking about the queen or his queen. But you see, when you love someone, you can't help but talk about someone. And when it's your wife, you can't help but keep your hands off your wife. And your children whom you love, you want to to cuddle them and love them and be with them. That's the natural expression of us as human beings when we love someone. Whether it's a child or a wife, we love them appropriately regarding the relationship. And we don't need to be embarrassed about this. We have the Song of Solomon. We have other passages that speak about this very thing. 
But when you love Jesus Christ, you can't help but speak about him. You can't help but think about him. To you, Samuel Rutherford, a dour Scot, lovesick for Jesus Christ. That's what happens in times of revival. It's not simply just looking at Christ as so many do and what has he done for me and focusing upon his work, however magnificent and beautiful it is, but it's going to a place even farther than that. You know where that is? His person. Loving him. Many Christians love Christ's benefits, and they love his benefits rightly, but many Christians love just Christ's benefits and therefore love his benefits wrongly. To love Christ's benefits takes you to his person so that, so that you live by faith by beholding the Son of God so that one day you might behold him by sight and be transformed into his image. That's the life we live. And if that is not the life you live, it is very questionable whether you are a Christian. Do you love the person of Jesus Christ? The fact that he is the eternal God and yet he condescended and took upon him flesh and now is forever the God-man whom we will behold. As a man looks at his neighbors, so we will behold Christ. And that is our hope and that is our expectation and that is our joy and that is our privilege. And that is the effect of a revival. People begin to love Jesus Christ. But they also become a people of prayer. The first president of Harvard University, Thomas Shepard, a Puritan export, made a comment that I think I can resonate with and perhaps one or two of you can resonate with. That there are times in my life when I would rather die than pray. So I will expose myself. And I suspect we may not put it that stark, but there are times in our life when we would rather mow the lawn and we would rather clean the dishes and we would rather do this and we would rather do that. And it's amazing how obedient to every other law we can become if we can put off that one thing. And I sometimes have to rip myself away even from things that in and of themselves are good, you know, like surfing the web, and fall upon my knees, and it is a temptation as I enter my office. Every time I walk through those doors, I know I can't go to that seat, that nice leather seat, and have my fingers start clicking away. I have to hit my knees and seek God. But you know what the real perverseness of my nature is? Is that I have some sort of catapult in my being that wants to launch me back into that seat so that I can justify getting this book done and getting that book done and answering this email and that email. Prayer is not easy if you know what prayer is. But in times of revival, It's as though it becomes easy and people give themselves to prayer. And there's a story of what really led to the Dutch Reformed Church. There was an English concentration camp and there were these Dutch Reformed men and the men were separated from the women and children. And it just so happened that the Spirit of God broke out upon these men one night and they prayed all night long. And I think it was hundreds of men in this concentration camp started praying and praying and praying. And those men, many of them ended up going on to be ministers in what was the high point of the Dutch Reformed Church. But if you look at the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa today, it is an absolute and total disaster. Notwithstanding some very godly ministers here and there, it is by and large a disaster. 
Revival came to those men and they prayed because that was the natural response to God's Spirit being poured out upon them among the many other responses of being cut to the heart and loving Jesus Christ. It was, what shall we do? But repent, believe, and you see the rest of Acts is about God's people praying and more on that tomorrow. But then finally... If we want to really sum up what we've been saying about revival and the effects of revival, we may simply say this. Revival is, in essence, heaven upon earth, literally. Heaven upon earth. It is Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, coming down as the Spirit of Christ upon his people in an unusual way, so that we can truly say that when we experience revival, whether personal revival, whether corporate revival, whether we look at periods in history over the course of the church, we can say heaven was upon earth. And how gracious of God to give us little foretastes of that at points in our life and at certain worship services where we can sometimes come away and we can feel like we were in heaven. Revival. Jesus Christ resurrected, ascended, sitting on his throne and blessing his people. More than they ask for and more than they deserve. Let's pray. O oh Lord our God, we thank you and praise you that we can even discuss these things. We thank you and praise you that we can hear of these things. And, O oh Lord, we pray that we may experience these things. Because, O oh Lord, to simply know of them, to know of all these blessings, oh, how jealous we are to want to experience them. And yet, O oh Lord, how carnal and how resistant we are to wanting to experience them. And so, Lord, take away the resistance that is in each and every one of us and bless us so that we love your Son more than we have ever loved him. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.